Recently, my friends and I were discussing how awesome it would have been to be sapient at the moment of a cultural phenomenon's birth. Now, we were thinking about the premiere of Star Wars when we raised the point. All of us failed, however, to realize that we were, in fact, sapient for the birth of a cultural phenomenon. Pokemon. Now, I get it, Pokemon's been done to death on this platform, so why do you want to listen to one more person talk about it? Well. I'd like to think I have a unique perspective on it, and I'm going to come at this from a different angle than most people do on YouTube. For one, I'm not going to talk about the video games because I never played them, never even owned a video gaming system until I was in my 20s, so the games that mean so much to so many mean nothing to me. Discard them entirely. I'm going to be coming at this from the angle of the card game. So the card game was still what I would like to consider an embodiment of its creator, Satoshi Tajiri's original intention. He created Pokemon to relive his childhood memories of wandering around the forest, collecting and classifying bizarre critters so that he could show them off to his classmates. Now that still kind of holds true in the card game. Collecting is a big deal, but I'm not coming at this from the viewpoint of a collector alone. I'm also coming at this from the viewpoint of a historian. You see, Pokemon reminds me a lot of something I've seen from Edo period Japan, and that would be a card game called Obake Karuta. Obake Karuta is a game where a central referee reads a list of clues describing a yokai, a creature of Japanese folklore, according to their habitat, their behavior, and their supernatural abilities. The players reach into a pile of cards in the middle of the table and try to find the yokai that matches the description the referee gave. And you do this as many times as it takes for you to accumulate the most cards on your own pile. In other words, to win, you gotta catch them all. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to do a little experiment. By playing the Pokemon card game with differing sets of cards, we're gonna determine if throughout all the card games existence from 1995 to right now, if throughout all of it, it still manages to retain the essence of Pokemon and the essence of collect and classify, the same kind of cultural phenomenon that was prevalent in Obake Karuta back in the Edo period into the 1920s. So let's set the parameters for how this little experiment is going to start. Obviously, we're going to be using the cards from the 90s and the 2000s as our control group, if you will, because that's what we grew up with, that's what we're used to, that set the standard for the card game for us. So, however this goes is going to determine what we think of the later versions of the cards and the game itself. Now, in order to set up a uh, further controlled control group, we're going to be using pretty similar deck structures when it comes to how many of each type of card is in the deck. We're going to each be using a 30 card deck, about 13 of those will be Pokemon themselves, there's going to be 7 trainer cards, and there are going to be the rest of them, the rest of the 10, energy cards, whatever kind of energy you need. These will be the trainer cards that we are using. There are going to be 2 potions two Pokeballs, two energy searches, and one energy removal in each person's deck. You won't be getting too much commentary from me on this first part of the experiment, because basically I want to leave well enough alone, let the game play itself, and let you guys see what it's like to play the first real version of the Pokemon card game. In terms of what we're hoping to accomplish here, we made a checklist that is just a bunch of general guidelines to see if this fulfills what we want out of a Pokemon card game. Does it invoke a sense of childlike wonder, which is subjective of course, but does it make us feel like it's pretty great? Does it promote friendly competition? This is a big one. Satoshi Tajiri's vision was that Pokemon would be something that brought people together in both a cooperative format but also an honorable competitive format something where you both could exercise your own mental capabilities to the fullest. Does it uh, adhere to the collect and classify themes of Japanese folklore, Satoshi Tajiri's vision, and also Obake Karuta? 
I'm pretty sure this will remain a consistent fixture throughout each incarnation of the game. But who knows? Does it preserve the idea of yokai as the little creatures with phenomenal powers? I'm also going to go out on a limb and say that this is going to uh, continue through each incarnation of the game, but it's just to be on the safe side. And the bonus that we have is does it in any literal way, rules and all, resemble the rules of its great great granddaddy, Obake Karuta? So those three cards, that's what resembles Obake Karuta to me, snatching up as many of these as you can in order to win the battle. So, as for what's going on now, we've got our hands, we've got our prize card set aside, we're going to do the coin flip for initiative. So here it is, shortly after play, we have the checklist pretty much all positively completed. Every single one of these was fulfilled in some way or another. And as for the uh, resembling in any way the rules of Obake Karuta, the only thing I can see with this is the prize cards. Like, we're not reading off clues to one another. We are kind of trying to understand something about each of these little pocket monsters and how they interact with each other, and in order to beat the other guy and get the prize card like you knew right off the bat i'm probably going to be using a lot of water so you went electric so that's understanding but it's not quite the same as reading a clue and scrambling to pick something up so i'm going to give that like a little half check so it's all well and good to show you guys a complete checklist and say mission accomplished but what did we really find out well I would argue that we found out that this version of the card game really does carry on the traditions that we were looking for. I'm talking both in terms of Satoshi Tajiri's vision and in terms of the collecting classified themes from the old Japanese folklore traditions. And I think Satoshi Tajiri's vision actually helps with this. If you foster a community based around a balanced game with rather whimsical, attractive artwork to the cards, then what you get is a community where you are inspired to go out and collect and classify your own deck. You're inspired to try different combinations of things, use different little pocket monsters to accomplish your goals. And I think that in its current state here in the 90s, this card game absolutely inspired that. So for the next part of our little experiment, we're going to see if these kind of positives carry over into the next generation of the now I'm talking about mid-2000s to early 2010s here. So we aren't getting too advanced just yet, but there are already some noticeable differences. So let's take a look at how this plays and draw our conclusions after the experiment. Basically, here I am in the control room for this very video, and what I'm doing is I'm watching the second match that I had with Mickey back, and I'm looking for stuff to comment on. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through highlights for you guys. I'm going to watch the full thing, but I'm going to choose the moments that really stuck out and that were different than our first game. So let's take a look. And let's divide. Well, yeah, let's divide. I like this new version of coughing. <laughs> there are so many coughings. Oh god, a bubble drain. Ta-da! Smack. 
basically, I'm not going to use that attack because these new cards have Pokemon that are the equivalent of trainer cards, and I don't have any more coughing in my deck, so I'm just going to let this guy sit here and die, I guess. Coughing, return. Go coughing. We're smogging you, so you're poisoned. One of the first things that I notice as I watch the footage of our gameplay back is that as we start off, our basic Pokemon have suffered, well, not suffered, they've benefited from a massive increase in their base hit points since the 90s. I could go on and on, but honestly, we're just gonna keep smogging and bubble draining each other for a little bit, it looks like. The problem with this is, is that their attack strength pretty much seems to remain the same. So what that means is, if you don't have extra energy or even another attack, you could be struggling trying to take each other down for not only just a minute now, but minutes. All right. Meryl is being I returned. I discard, and I get rid of poison. Yep. I move forward with Jigglypuff and Lullaby. I'm, I'm asleep. asleep. You are asleep. Smogged, poison, and there you go. Turn. Start pounding away. All right, that is 20 damage to me. So that's, you're now at 30. Yeah. At least the use of special attacks like, you know, a lullaby or a smog, which either puts you to sleep or poisons you, that carries over here and it still retains its tactical advantage if you want to do it correctly. Coughing, return. Go Trubbish. Okay, right there, you see that? That's this guy entering the fray. Trubbish here. Now, what's so special about this moment is that it proves a point that I, it's been nagging at me since we started this experiment. You, you know those new types, Dark, Steel, Fairy, and Dragon? Yeah, those are new card types, but they also come with their own new energy types, which I don't agree with. The reason is I think that locks you into using certain cards for certain strategies, whereas with something like Trubbish here, he's a dark type for sure, and that makes a difference when calculating weakness and resistance, but he can be used in any type of deck as a little, you know, last effort to pull a trick out of the bag, no pun intended. I think that worked marvelously here, and I think that would make the game so much more diverse and so much more interesting if more cards in these new types worked like Trubbish did. Trubbish uses Venishock, which does 20 plus 50 more if you're poisoned, which you are. Aerial A, 60 damage. Oh, that's very effective. This moment is pretty much the other side of the coin that I've noticed. Whereas sometimes the problem is your attack power in this new version of the game is too weak, sometimes the problem is that there's too much of an attack power. Mickey's Skarmory here has 110 hit points and an attack that has the potential to do 90 damage in one swipe. All of the old cards, save for maybe four, are instantly going to be knocked out by something like that. In what universe is that freaking fair? I don't even need to use that attack. I'll just evolve him right there. Mm -hmm. And that'll that'll do it. We're gonna seed bomb you for 40. Hopefully if you evolve, you get more hit points, you get more attack power, you can have a hope in hell of taking on a basic card like Skarmory. But even as I evolve Trevenant, when it's still new to the field, it's not going to have enough attack power to damage that thing very much. It takes me a while to power up an evolved form like Trevenant to come back at a basic like Skarmory. So once more, how is this fair? Why even bother evolving? Why not just go with a stronger basic? Match a Skarmory with a Skarmory or something like it at this point. Sorry. Use, use, potion. use potion. All right. And I swing with aerial ace. I attempt to flip for 30 additional damage. 30, 30 additional damage, damage. That's 90 on you. It leaves you with 40. So you may want to take yeah. those counters I had. Oh yeah, never mind. That justifies it. Instead of knocking me out in one move, she can knock me out in two. 
Trevenant uses Shadow Cage. And done. Skarmory fainted. In terms of friendly competition here, I can say that it's taking a little bit of a downturn, not by much. It's just that with those boosted HP levels and attack levels that remain the same at the beginning there, it developed into a slugfest, which wasn't entertaining in the least. It felt like time was dragging on and on. So that's slightly discouraging. As for the collect and classify, I'd say that's still encouraged because that Trubbish was an interesting uh, trick that you could pull. So getting more Pokemon of different types in your deck, that's still highly encouraged. Evolutions, not so much anymore, but what this does encourage you to go out and find is stronger basic Pokemon like that Skarmory. So I guess that aspect is perfectly retained. You're still going to want to collect and classify more strong basics. As for the uh, essence of yokai battling it out, it seems like we're starting to get into god territory here. Not so much just your friendly little woodland sprites having a battle anymore. So I'm going to give that one half a check mark for this one. For Obaki Karuta, we weren't really snatching up any cards this time around. It was such a drag that that just didn't happen at all. So that's our conclusion from this one. All around, it's kind of middling, I would say. And now for the third portion of the experiment, we're going to be playing a round of the most recent incarnation of the card game, including a lot more of the cards from the late 2010s up to the current era. We're still going to be using 30 card decks but don't let that fool you. Here there be monsters. We are here at the most modern, updated version of the card game. So let's see what our first Pokemon are, shall we? One, two, three. I swear that was not planned. You are so lucky that this is not weak to electricity. Otherwise, I would call bullshit right off the bat. I drop you, I drop you. I attach an energy, I swing for Circle Circuit. This attack does 30 damage for each of your benched Pokémon, so I do 90 damage. Okay, it's dead. And I'll swing again and end your current Pokémon yep. with Circle Circuit. 30 times how many Pokémon, which is 120, double that because of his weakness, which makes it 240 damage. My research seems to have failed on this one. I mean, look at these things, how overpowered can you get? I was planning on talking about the Charizard all the way through this, but the experiment halted before he even hit the field. Ash's Pikachu is much worse than the Charizard nuke. Now look at this, in fact I did some research, I did some research on this online and it seems like everybody on this site is saying the exact same thing, that because of cards like this, the game is just completely tactically neutered right now. Everything you're going to be facing in the setting is these V cards or extremely powerful basics. If you're not doing that, you're going to lose the game, and I can see that as a very real possibility. So what does that mean for our conclusions? Well, let's go down the list. Does it evoke a sense of childlike wonder? Not really. It evokes the sense of a bunch of nerds sitting around a hobby shop table and measuring who has the biggest Pokemon fee. Now, does it still adhere to the themes of Japanese folklore with yokai as mystical little creatures with powers? No, it does not. This is full-on Battle of the Gods. Yeah, I know, in the anime, Ash's Pikachu is pretty much a god too, but here in the card game, Ash's Pikachu goes way beyond a god and just becomes a cosmic threat. Does this still represent the collect and classify theme? At least collect and classify for fun that comes out of Edo period Japan and infiltrates modern culture today. I think it does, actually, but not in a good way. Instead of collecting and classifying to make your own deck with your own theme and your own strategy to make it interesting for your opponent, well, now everybody's collecting and classifying the same identical list because that's what works. There's no fun in that, but it's still technically collecting and classifying. It doesn't resemble in any way the rules of Obaki Karuta. Not in as much as any other part of the card game get, did, so I guess that's just a half check there too. My rational side is saying that in the end, yes, Pokemon is still the same kind of game it always was. From the card game to the video game, so I hear it's still all about 
collecting and classifying for the sake of having fun. That's what my rational side says. But my sentimental side is screaming in internal rage, wondering how the hell somebody who made this card game, somebody who designed these new cards, could have absolutely butchered Tajiri's original vision of friendly competition, of essentially getting a community together around this. Because if a community is just copying off of one or two people, not thinking for themselves, and not even having fun doing it, then what's the point anymore? All right, enough of the ranting. I could do that all day, and I don't want this to take any longer than it already has to. So I swear, I swear, I swear, next video I do, we'll go back into miniature wargaming, we'll go back into a little bit of the painting techniques. Thank you all for bearing with me this long. This is just something that I felt compelled to research. So now that it's over, y'all can go about your ordinary days. Take what I say with a grain of salt, sympathize. I really don't mind either which way. If you feel like leaving a comment telling me about your perspective on Pokemon, whether it be from the video games or the card games or whatever, feel free to do so. I'd love to engage in some form of discussion as per usual. So until then guys, thank you for watching and I'll see you later.